Uh, this will be a bit of a, an introduction to um, this person here, Charles Darwin, uh, some of the other key people involved with uh, the topic that we're about to dive into, which is the origins of biodiversity. It's topic 3.2 for our ESS class. Um, we will get more into natural selection and evolution um, in the coming lessons, but for now, it's, it's a bit of the foundation. Who is involved? Who are the key players behind this? And why do we all know the name Charles Darwin today? And are there other names that we should know as well? Yes, there are. Let's go. So, um, some of the early beliefs about how things changed over time, why we have so many different things out there, different species out there in the planet, came from um, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. He was a French biologist. And uh, we all just sort of accepted what Lamarck said early on, and, and it wasn't necessarily correct. Uh, Lamarck proposed the idea that things change because they need to or they want to. Uh, a good example is the giraffe. The giraffe is very tall because the food is up high and it really, really, really wants to get to that food and it needs to eat. Therefore, it stretches and gets tall. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case. We know about Star Wars, and if you really want the remote control, it doesn't just sort of pop into your hand. Um, those ideas, people thought, well, things are so diverse out there, something's changing them. What is changing them? Um, well, Alfred Russell Wallace and Charles Darwin were the key players who uh, came up with this notion called natural selection. And it was uh, explosive at the time because it let go of all, of all our control as humans. Um, because what they propose is nature decides, not humans, uh, not the animal, not the organism itself, but nature determines who survives and passes on its genes to the next generation. Back to the giraffe example. Um, the giraffe is trying to eat food and there's a drought season so the food really is just at the tallest bits of the trees where no other things can compete. Um, therefore, the tall giraffes have food. They're going to eat. They're going to probably survive until reproductive age, um, which is, you know, it's a bit of time there. And they'll pass on their genes. They'll have babies. They'll pass on those genes, likely tall genes, if a tall is mating with a tall. Uh, to the next generation, therefore the next generation will inherit predominantly tall genes. The shorter giraffes uh, probably will have died off because they didn't get to eat, so those short genes won't be passed on to the next generation. Um, it's important to note here that Gregor Mendel was actually studying genetics at the time, um, we call him the father of genetics, and actually had written Charles Darwin a letter to discuss some of these ideas, but Darwin didn't reply to his letter, and had they have actually met and discussed, uh, genetics and evolution could have actually come together and we would be f much further along in our understanding of, of evolution and genetics today. Um, so opportunity missed by Darwin there. Now, um, behind the slide, I'm just gonna pull this picture down little cheeky picture here of uh, Charles Darwin becoming a pop star. That's actually Michael Jackson in the background. I couldn't resist, sorry. Um, but Char Charles Darwin did become a bit of a, a pop star. Oops, let me get rid of this. There you go. Wow, why is it doing that? There we are. I don't know why it's doing that. You're going to see that recording thing disappear. How do we get rid of that? That's interesting. Okay, sorry about that. There we are. Um, Charles Darwin decided, uh, well, initially he was supposed to be uh, going into surgery, become a doctor. That was his big, big scheme, big plan. But he actually did not uh, do pretty well when it came to blood and surgery. Uh, they say he got really queasy and he couldn't stand the sight of blood on people. So kind of had a bit of a moment in his life where he thought, oh my God, what am I going to do? I was going to be a doctor. Now what? Uh, so he decided to become a naturalist and got quite lucky because a friend of his was um, leading uh, an expedition on the HMS Beagle, uh, funded by the, the royal government, uh, the British government, and to go and explore uh, South, uh, South America and do some mapping as well as send Darwin along as a naturalist to collect species and learn about really what's, what animals and plants are living in those areas. 
Charles Darwin happened to be a very observant person. He had amazing abilities to observe and collect. And for five years, from 1831 to 1836, Charles Darwin collected and collected and collected and collected along that journey. Um, some notable places, well, the most notable place that we all know about today that he spent about three weeks, if I'm not mistaken, on uh, was the Galapagos. And he collected a lot of uh, bird species and other specimens. He didn't have the epiphany of natural selection during this trip. He came back um, to England and he had a lot of friends who were naturalists. And one of his friends was an ornithologist and came and actually really helped him discover the differences between the beaks of these different bird species on different islands. And together they said, ah, this is, there's this be, uh, birds with very long beaks on this island. What were they eating? And started to discover that nature was actually providing the food and those with, who were fit to get to that food were surviving. Back to the giraffes, the same idea. So if you had a very big, strong beak and you were on an island with big, strong nuts, you could crack the nuts to get to them. If you had that weak, feeble beak that's very delicate, you couldn't crack the nut. You were dying and you weren't passing on those genes. However, if you were on an island with uh, a tree, let's say with a grub inside of a small area where you had to have a very precise beak to reach, then you would be, you'd be very fit and you would survive. So fittest was really applicable to the environment. And that comes back to the name, natural selection. Nature is selecting who survives, not the individual. Um, quite novel stuff for the time. So novel that he didn't publish his book for another 20 years. Um, he was very afraid of being labeled as a heretic when he got back to England with some of these ideas because to give up our center of the universe ideas and to say, no, actually nature is in control, we're not sorry. Um, that went against the religious community of the time and he was uh, really afraid of being ostracized and being shunned from the scientific community as well because of this. So he packed away all of his ideas in his book. He made a lot of publications, but he packed away his big, big book, which is this one over here on the origin of species um, for 20 years, which is unbelievable. What inspired him? Um, actually, before we get into that, we'll look at this picture. And this picture, if I can move my face over a little bit there, this picture is one of the most controversial pieces from his book. And you can see the title, Origin of Species. This picture Charles Darwin drew uh, shows the origin down here as a number one, and it shows that different species are connected to that number one. Um, now, if we go back to the number one, that refers to the origin. So it's pretty uh, revealing here what, what Darwin was trying to say and do at the time. And that was a lot of the controversy because humans inevitably would be linked to that spot as well. Now, uh, eventually he published, 1859, and it was an immediate success, in part because uh, it was infamous in some circles, and that actually gave him more publicity. They say no news is good news, I suppose, right? Um, it's been labeled as one of the most influential books still today. You can do a Google search on that, and it still ranks in the top most influential books of all time, along with books like the Bible and the Quran. Um, so interesting to note there that this book is still flying off the shelves. Um, now, if you want to learn more about, oh, I forgot a big one here. I was going to mention Alfred Russell Wallace um, and why Charles Darwin published on this date. Alfred Russell Wallace had actually met with Charles Darwin and said, hey, I'm going to go do some research of my own uh, about how things change over time and had his epiphany and came to a very, very similar conclusion that nature is selecting. And he was studying in the South Pacific and he was looking at butterflies in different islands. So really quite similar to the Galapagos, but, but in a totally different part of the world. Uh, and he came up with the idea of natural selection. He shared his research with Darwin, who had this major freak out and said, I'm about to be scooped by this guy who just went out there. Um, but being a, a pretty uh, good scientist and fair human, he invited Wallace back and they presented together. He presented Wallace's work alongside of his own work at the same time. 
Um, over time, however, Darwin being the senior in this story uh, gets all the credit for natural selection. It's a bit unfair for Alfred Russell Wallace because he sort of faded off and he's only mentioned um, in the preface of the book uh, on the origin of species. And a lot of biology books actually just skip right over Alfred Russell Wallace, who unfortunately should be listed, in my opinion, um, right up there with Charles Darwin for coming to these, this conclusion. Now, um, there's some great resources out there, uh, and I'll put those in uh, the, the description below. Here's a nice short video about Alfred Russell Wallace. It's about seven minutes long. Um, it's told by the Natural History Museum curator and also a professor at Harvard. They do the, the um, storytelling behind this video. It's really quality. And here's another one from the same source. Again, um, this one focuses on Charles Darwin and how he came up with the na uh, theory of natural selection. In our next class, what we're going to get into is actually more in depth about evolution and provide some pieces of evidence for evolution. So we're going to actually look at um, things like our pentadactyl limb. Five, there it is. Where's my hand? There it is. Five-fingered limb and how a bat has the same digits, as a whale has the same digits, as a human has the same digits, and um, looking at how that can provide us with some evidence. We'll look at DNA, the fossil record, uh, lots of pieces to the puzzle that help us understand this very interesting story. Okay, so I hope that helps for now, and look forward to our next class together online. Mm -hmm.